Okay, that <clears throat> we learned some um, about biodiversity, and so let's start looking at how we got so much biodiversity on the Earth. Uh, so this lecture is going to be on evolution and natural selection, which are the processes which allow us to have so much life on the Earth. So so different. Um, and the first thing is, let's go ahead and and at least talk about the elephant in the room. I know this subject uh, to some people who are very religious is, um, is not very popular. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a scientist that spends every morning, uh, a certain amount of time every morning in prayer. So I too have very strong spiritual feelings. Uh, but I don't have any problem accepting this. Um, and I'm going to have to ask you in this class that, at least for the test, um, I'm going to tell you, this is a fact to me um, that this has been happening. Uh, and I don't want to get into the, the, the spiritual dimensions. I'm not going to. But the fact that animals change over time uh, the fact that there's a fossil record that's millions of years old, um, hundreds of millions of years old, um, that's a fact. So, okay, the core principles are that all life formed from a common ancestor, population of living things change with time, the environment influences those changes and advantageous traits are selected over less advantageous. And that's, that's essentially natural selection, which is how evolution occurs. Natural selection is the process, evolution is the result. And the definition of evolution that we're going to go with is the genera, genera, generational change, easy for you to say, and adaptation of organisms to their environment through natural selection. And it's not a theory, but a fact, as I've already said. Okay, let's look at, at five pieces of evidence that what I'm saying, it backs up what I'm saying, that this is a fact. First is the fossil record, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, comparative biochemistry, DNA, and recent and experimental evidence. The fossil record uh, has revealed uh, so much change uh, over millions of years. It's a lot of fossils, a lot of good fossil records for marine organisms. These are trilobites that anywhere from 500 million years ago to 409 million years ago. It shows all the different changes and each one of these would have been, for some reason, at this period of time, uh, these anterior uh, points, posterior points, would have been uh, advantageous. Um, we can't go back and see what it was. This is a, a, a very simple diagram, but mammals evolve from reptiles. And one of the key differences is that Reptiles have several bones in their lower jaw, in the dentary bone. Um, you and I have one, all mammals only have one. And in the fossil record, you can see a reptile over time from about four, 350 million years ago to 300 million years ago. Reptiles, mammals have been around a long time. Uh, you can see in the fossil record how these bones fused, and two of these bones ended up moving into our middle ear. And there's, there's an excellent fossil record of that occurring slowly over time. If you look at the fossils of our own species, you can see that our skull has been increasing over time from anywhere from 530,000 years ago um, to present. Um, and it's really interesting to look at comparative anatomy. Um, look at the fossil record of the horses. 
um, you can see that the foot that was once four toes has fused and become one. It's now known as the cannon bone. Um, that one hoof uh, enables, and a lot of, there's a lot of large mammals now like deer, they have two toes, but it's essentially a hoof. Um, helps them run as fast as possible. The less amount, least amount of surface area uh, that strikes the ground helps an animal move it quicker, uh, which increases every millisecond is important. Um, here's the fossil record showing uh, the time period of animals that moved from the land back into the sea. And here, more interesting to me, this is one of the original tetrapods um, that animals that came from the sea onto land, they became amphibians and then reptiles, mammals, and then birds. Um, and you can see they have the same bone structure 364 million years ago as these animals moved out of the water that you and I have. You have a humerus, an ulna, a radius, and fingers. Let's look at this with invertebrates, the mammals. Look at the hand of a whale, a cat, a bat, and a gorilla. It's all extremely uh, similar. Um, obviously, whales don't really need a hand. Uh, bats actually use their finger to um, produce camber in their wings, which helps them fly much better. Um, obviously, we use our hand. <laughs> it, it's one of our main adaptations. Cats, it's, the, all the bones are there, even though they're really not using it in any kind of way like we do. You think, you think you ever had gills? No, you did. You just don't remember it. Um, while we're developing in the uterus, uh, we have a period, humans do, that we have pharyngeal slits, which are gills. So essentially, you're breathing, and, and although most of the nutrition, oxygen, everything you need, and your waste products are exchanged back and forth through the placenta, so, um, some is done through the, the fluids. Um, it's basically a remnant of our past. Um, we certainly don't need gills like a lamprey does, but we still have those that remnant of, and that's when, when we talk about descent from, uh, with modification, that's an evidence of descent. And by still keeping some train traits and, modif and modifying them, or changing over time, uh, it's a good piece of evidence that we all came from one ancestor. DNA is really open to everything. Um, it, is, it is how life is formed. In each cell you have, you have three, essentially two meters of DNA in every nucleus and every and all three trillion cells in your body. And that those nucleotide bases on DNA um, small parts of them are what uh, produce proteins in that cell. Those small parts of the DNA are what we know as genes. You can have two different alleles of the same gene, for example, five different alleles. You can have brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes. Those are alleles of the trait eye color, which is a gene, which is one location on the DNA of one chromosome. Hope that makes sense. Now, almost all multicellular organisms have an enzyme that is required for fast metabolism or metabolism in general, and that's called cytochrome C. Uh, cytochrome C is seen in yeast uh, all the way up to us. And by looking at the similarity of these nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, how they pair up with each other. You can see how many differences there are. Because the gene is probably not near as long or as large as you think. It may only be a list of a thousand nucleotides in a row. And 
we only have 66 differences within those thousand nucleotides with the yeast. Uh, we only are different, have 13 different nucleotide differences um, with a pig. But we're closer to a pig than we are a duck. We're closer to a duck than we are a snake and a tuna and a maw. And in this, um, from te formally teaching a class on evolution and, and particularly vertebrate evolution, I can assure you that we're not that closely related, but we certainly are closer related to pigs. Okay, this is important for me, to me, for you to learn. There are three musts for evolution, that, that, and this. This is how it occurs. There's genetic variability in traits. You and I and all of us look different. And those are because of different genes, and those genes cause traits, whether it be hair color, eye color, skin color, height, etc. Um, and these traits are inherited by the next generation. You got the, the DNA from your mom and dad. You got 50% from dad, 50% from mom. And that causes the trait, hair color, eye color, height, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that will be inherited, and you will pass on uh, those genes to your offspring if you have some. Uh, now, Luckily, we don't have a whole lot of negative traits where the environment takes us out of the, out of the equation. We, but wildlife and animals in general, um, if they're not well adapted, if they have poor traits, they may not breed, or if they, they do, they won't produce near as many offspring as those animals that have good traits, make them healthy, strong. Cow, cows want to breed with that bull. Um, those traits are passed on to the next generation, and over time, most of the animals have those good traits. The poor traits are, are what we call selected out of the organism, um, and it goes on through millennia of generations. So, natural selection then acts on an individual. Say you have a bird species and one particular individual that uh, hatches from the egg has a very short beak. That individual is not able to eat very well and eventually dies before it has a chance to breed. Sad, but that's, that's how it works. Nature's not very nice. So that trait then is selected out of the population. The trait, the trait, the the beaks that allow the animal, the bird species to eat the most will be selected for. Selecting, that's the term we use in biology, and it means that beak is going to become more prevalent, more prevalent, more prevalent, because all of those, with the, all the birds with that beak are surviving well, they're in good shape, and they're producing offspring. So that beak shape, that beak size, that beak length will be selected for. That beak length, side, or shape is caused from genes producing proteins in the cell that make the, uh, in the beak, that create the form that it is in. Genes are located on the DNA. They're passed on to the offspring. The cause and organism have good or bad traits. Parents with good traits have loss of offspring. Parents with poor traits often die before breeding and don't pass them on. So I'm, I'm getting repetitious here, but I want to make sure that you understand that. Now, alleles. Remember I talked about eye color, different alleles. Here we're looking at a diagram with frogs, and we're looking at the color of the frog. One is lighter, one is darker, uh, and that's because they've been isolated from each other. This particular dark frog happened to end up living in an environment with dark green vegetation. The lighter colored frog happened to end up in an environment with say more desert light, so it's lighter color vegetation. So obviously lighter colored frogs are going to be selected for 
whereas darker color frog are going to be selected for um, in the population after it's split. Now the important thing for you to know, and I'm going to go over this several times too, is here's your original population. There had to be a dark form and there had to be a lighter color form for these two to evolve. These frogs, you can't have um, a bunch of dark colored frogs that end up in a light colored vegetation and they can't just sit there and think, oh, I need to be a lighter colored. It won't work. That, G, that natural selection works on the lighter colored frogs will have a higher survival of their young over time the large proportion of the population will be lighter colored because they're better camouflaged and won't be eaten as often and they will continue to have more offspring more offspring more offspring the whole population is primarily light colored ways of genetic change are mutations gene flow genetic drift non-random mating and then natural selection is always present let's go over each uh, first let's talk about genetic mutations and how they occur and there's an enzyme called polymerase and every time your cells split and you're gonna have three trillion cells over the base of your life DNA replication is occurs and every time cells split it's almost perfect there's a mistake only one in one in one billion times that DNA is replicated. That's almost, well, if you have three trillion cells, though, that's a lot of mistakes. It adds up. So you have cells in your body with definite mutations. If those mutations happen to be in your gametes, your egg or your sperm cells, then you will pa possibly pass that on to the next generation. That mutation may either be good, that mutation may either be bad. Uh, it may not have any effect at all. Um, I, I put pictures of horses in there um, just because horses today, you have all the different breeds. My parents raised horses, Arabian, you have thoroughbreds, uh, you have quarter horses, and those horses all look different and they're bred to have certain characteristics. Now the environment is not causing those characteristics. These happen to be wild horses on the Gila River Nation uh, reservation, but um, domestic horses, they, they go through what's called artificial selection. I mean, Chihuahuans and Great Danes are still the same species. They're the result of people wanting large dogs or rarely small dogs. And they kept breeding smaller and smaller dogs to get a Chihuahua. They kept breeding larger and larger dogs to get a Great Dane. Uh, and that's called artificial selection. It's very, very different than natural selection. Mutations can be rare. Well, they are rare. Uh, they may be fatal. They may be beneficial, as I've said earlier, and they may not affect survival. Uh, this guy here is having no problem with six figures. Well, polyandry, um, it happens, there's a couple of baseball players, uh, pitchers that have it, probably with an advantage. Um, so mutations tend to have a, the, the word tends to have a negative connotation because it tends to be associated with birth defects, which is terrible. Um, but they're also every positive trait we have, our brain size, which is our main adaptation, why there's seven billion of us plus, is due to mutation. So it doesn't necessarily. Now, a lot of times you'll see traits and they, especially in humans, and they don't seem to have, make sense. I mean, why are there dark skinned people? Why are there light skinned people? But with study, for example, dark skinned people have a difficulty um, producing vitamin D and they're more likely to develop rickets. But in very sunny environments, dark skin absorbs much more vitamin D than, um, and they don't, get, they don't have near the uh, sunburn or chances of skin cancer as a light-skinned person. 
light skin readily produces vitamin D, but is more susceptible to skin cancer uh, and painful sunburn if you've ever been there. Um, processes that affect different alleles, which means traits, eye color, hair, um, include mutation, genetic drift, bottleneck, founder effect, and gene flow. So let me go through these. The first is gene flow, and this is just, this is nothing but animals moving and immigrating, migrating. Um, this particular uh, very simple diagram, you've got western deer that are tan versus the brown eastern deer. There's a pass, it's difficult for the deer to get there, but there is some movement back and forth. So you're going to have a couple different alleles, meaning tan deer, because these genes produce tan deer, over in the eastern population, and eventually you will have some eastern deer with their allele uh, moving over to the western deer population. It's just much easier to think of it as, as human beings with skin color. Now that we have airplanes and, and ships, um, we have a lot of diversity in skin color around the world. Um, and it's just because of migration of, of, of different genes. Now, when gene flow or what we call genetic drift becomes important is when we have very small populations or what we call bottleneck. So say for example, um, and this is kind of a silly red penguin, normal penguin, uh, but you have a large population in this example of 10,000. Um, there's a massive catastrophe. Uh, only 50% of the population survives. But in the larger population, there's 10% red individuals, but more of them happen to live on this side where there was the catastrophe, and now we're down to 9%. In a small population, if you lose 10% of the organisms, and it happens, or 50%, and it happens to be the few individuals that had the red allele for red penguins, you never know, glaciers may turn red in the future, um, that um, that can have a very negative or deleterious effect, or a very positive effect sometimes. And we'll get to that. That's through the founder effect. So when animal populations really decline, and uh, I have a picture here of an elephant seal, which were almost, they estimate they were down to 200. They lost a lot of genes, a lot of alleles, uh, when that population declined. So the amount of genetic variation is very, very small in that population. Now, as somebody who's been involved in conservation, that could be very negative. The population, a population has more variation in their alleles, is more likely to endure some sort of catastrophe, global warming, global cooling, whatever happens in the future, none of us know. They're more, much more likely to be able to live through that because there's a much greater chance that there are individuals in that population that have a trait that can accept that kind of environmental change. When the population goes down to extremely small, there's a much greater chance that you've lost that variation. Um, today we have populations like black-footed ferrets or Mexican wolves that went down to eight to 18 individuals. Uh, and now they have these software programs and they're, interbre they're breeding and they're moving animals around and, and really, you know what they're doing? They're kind of praying for change. Um, they're 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 trying to keep in they're trying to keep individuals where there's possible variation. They they keep trying to to breed individuals that are as far related as possible. But when you start with 18 individuals, most of them are pretty closely related, um, and you're just hoping that there's mutations. Um, over time, and these mutations are beneficial, not deleterious, uh, and we try and keep that species alive. And that's how a lot of conservation biologists, biologists like my wildlife biologists, um, 
That's what we're trying to do with small population. We try to reduce inbreeding to almost nothing, but it, we're really just hoping for change, praying for change in the allele frequency over time through mutations and keeping them alive. I mentioned the founder effect, and this has happened several times. This is a really, this is a sunflower, helianthus, that lives in California. This is a, a beautiful silver plant with this huge seed head on Maori. That was the same species. This just was a, a mutant. And this seed was carried inside a bird, because the bird had eaten the seed. And this mutant seed got planted on top of Maui's volcano. And now you have this plant that has, because it can, uh, that has began reproducing, um, producing smaller plants, and they, that's a founder effect. I mean, certainly you would call it a different species now, but pollen from this plant can, can um, um, fertilize eggs on this plant. So it, it's, you know, it's just bizarre. Now, the founder effect in human, several times you had very small groups of people get in a boat, ship, take off across the Atlantic Ocean, form new populations. There was one group in Pennsylvania where everybody had six fingers. Um, a little more serious is when you have a group of people that have a mutation for a disease, and in that new population, because several people have that mutation, uh, and they were all closely related when they took off on their ship. Um, now you have a much greater prevalence of these different diseases. And I don't want to go into detail on that, but just just know when you have a small group and they take off, that it's much more likely for deleterious mutations to show up and appear in that group. I think you can see the logic there. Now, non-random mating um, is basically what we call sexual selection. Um, we have this kind of bland guppy on the left uh, and the beautiful guppy on the right. The females will almost always select the pretty colored male. Um, female elk are going to select the bull with the larger antlers. And those larger antlers help that bull protect his harem um, and keep smaller bulls from trying to breed. Therefore, elk antlers, large elk antlers are preserved in that. And that's because the females select them. Not because there's any, there's really no, you know, having six points on one side is no different than having five points as far as the environment is concerned. You have just as much protection from mountain lion predation with five points as you do six points. But six and seven point bulls are propagated in the population because that's what the females want. This is a, a fossil of an uh, Irish elk, okay? Closely related to the R elk. And you can see the ridiculous antlers on that poor animal. And because females kept selecting larger and larger antlers, the species eventually went extinct because the males couldn't handle it. They could not walk around and survive for 12 months out of the year um, through bad winter catastrophes or whatever um, with those size antlers. And they eventually died out. It, it, it just wasn't a good thing. So. I have a picture of a frog here in the background. And scientists have already always hypothesized that sexual selection occurs because females, whether they know it or not, they, their genes uh, behave, a lot of beha uh, behavior is genetic. Um, we'll get to that at some other time. But the females select males that are stronger uh, and have brighter colors and birds or guppies because it takes more energy it takes more you have to be in very good shape to have brighter colors you have to be in very good condition to have large antlers 
you have to be able to obtain food, avoid being eaten. And these are traits that females want to see in their mates so their offspring have a better chance of surviving. So with DNA analysis, this was actually, um, it was able to be tested. And they first did it on frogs. Uh, one of the first studies was done on frogs in Central America. And the hypothesis was females select males, frogs, that call the longest, therefore they are the strongest, and there's a higher chance that their offspring survive. We always assumed this. This was something that made sense logically, but we we're never really able to prove it. And then with DNA analysis, it became easier and easier. Uh, they were able to start looking at it. And they looked at this uh, Central America frog species. Now, the frogs that call the longest also have the greatest risk of being eaten. There's, so, there's a couple bat species in Central America. They're called frog-eating bats. The longer you call, the better chance of you being eaten by that frog-eating bat. Also, for you to call great lengths of time, that takes a lot of your energy. It's like running a marathon every night. So during the day, instead of resting up for the next night, they're out eating all the time because they have completely drained their energetic reserves. Therefore, they have to be at least intelligent not to get eaten and have to be able to obtain food fairly quickly, meaning they're in good shape. So if the female selects that animal, hopefully there's a better chance of their young uh, being in better shape. Well, with DNA analysis, they were able to test it. And so after the frogs stopped calling, they identified which frogs called the longest, and they took a DNA swab of those frogs. Then they took the tadpoles and sampled DNA from several of them, and, and depending on the puddle or the pond, 80 to 90 to 95 percent of the DNA found in those tadpoles were from the long calling frog. So they definitely are selecting the frogs that are in the best condition, or at least call the longest, take the most risk. Um, what was even more important than that, as far as what we believed would happen, is they were able to take the, follow those tadpoles into adulthood, into the adult morph, and say and find out yes, the the animals that that had the DNA from those long calling males, their offspring, had a much higher chance of surviving and even reproducing in the future. So they called that the truth in advertising. So the, the brightly colored birds that the females always select. It takes a lot of energy to produce those bright colors. You have to be smart enough to avoid predation to have those bright colors. Um, so over time, they've been able to collect a lot of evidence that said yes, that, and that's called sexual selection. Females select males that have characteristics that show they're the strongest, and it makes certain evolutionary sense. Natural selection, um, we've talked about already. Uh, just for example, here the zebra stripes, and you might think to yourself, why the heck is black and white stripes adaptive? Well, for monochromatic, meaning lions that only see black and white, those stripes blend right into the high grass, which if you can see in this photograph behind the text, um, these zebras are walking through very high grass and it actually does make them better camouflage. So this trait of black and white stripes was selected for because they weren't eaten as often as zebras without those stripes. Now, here's a term I want you to be familiar with, and it's going to be on the test, and that's called fitness. Now, you and I, when we sit around and we talk about fit individuals, we're probably talking about people who exercise a lot, that run a lot, do yoga a lot, um, and generally in good shape. Fitness to biologists has nothing to do with whether the strongest, the meanest, the fastest, Fitness means who passes on the most offspring to the next generation. Everything to do with that. A good example would be to show kin selection. And this has to do with fitness. 
These are uh, round-tailed prairie dogs, and they are preyed upon quite often by hawks. Uh, and when they're up on the surface, at times they will yell and scream at the group to get that alarm call to, to let everyone know, all the other squirrels in the area know, there's a hawk scram. Now there's a danger to calling because it will bring the attention of that hawk to you instead of the, all the other individuals that are scramming. Um, so there's a danger in doing that. So why do it? Why just not, you know, don't you just ignore it? Well, it, it, and again, animals are different than humans, and we'll get to that in an activity later on. But they found out that those squirrels always call alarm calls when their offspring are out, when their parents are out, sometimes when their grandchildren are out when their brothers and sisters are around, maybe their niece and nephew, but they don't do it when their spouse. In other words, this is a gene that has been selected for to scream when you're closely related to that animal, to that other animal. Not so much what's going on, it, it's just a behavior that they only use it when closely related individuals are around. Not closely related individuals, you might bring attention to yourself. So they don't do it. This is a, a diagram that shows change over time. We talked about experimental evidence uh, as being one of the uh, factors you know, that backs up that natural selection occurs. Uh, these are some finches in the Galapagos Islands, and they've been studying forever, ever since Darwin left there. Uh, and here, on this particular finch species, they're measuring beak depth. And beak depth has, has a lot to do with how large of a seed you can eat. During a drought, they saw an increase in the beak depth over a two to three year period. Then after the drought left, the beak depth went back. And what to what it was originally, and what that's showing is these anim these birds that had a bigger beak depth could eat larger seeds. Well, larger seeds are found on perennial plants, not annual plants, and therefore the animals that were best adapted for eating large seeds survived and reproduced. Those that were more adapted, the beak depth was more adapted for eating weed seeds, weren't able to survived because there wasn't enough food available because of the drought. So beak depth changed. And it will change back. It, it, it depends on what's going on. You need to know that when you look at an animal, you're seeing its history. When you look at the adaptations of an animal, you're seeing its history. For example, I don't have a picture here, it's one of my favorite animals. In Arizona and throughout the western North America, there's a species called pronghorn. And these species are probably the best terrestrial athlete in the world. They can run 40 miles per hour, which is impressive, second only to the cheetah, but they can run 40 miles per hour for an hour. They have incredible ability to, to run. And they have, you know, they're 400% they're better at taking oxygen down in the air than our best uh, Tour de France athletes. They're just incredible athletes. Why do these animals have to be so fast? There is no predator in the United States and North America that can eat them. However, if you look at the fossil record, 10,000 years ago, there was a cheetah in North America that was 25% larger, therefore faster, than the cheetah in Africa that already runs 60 miles per hour. So the, what you're seeing in the speed of that pronghorn is that's an adaptation to its evolutionary history, not an adaptation for what happens tomorrow. Animals, we don't, you and I don't have traits for what's going to happen tomorrow. We have traits that's going to help us today. And if the environment suddenly changes dramatically, those of us that have traits that help, that can survive that, are okay. Those of us who don't, I'm no longer here. Nature's tough. 
There's three modes of natural selection that are recognized. I realize I'm dragging on here. Um, I'm doing one is stabilizing, one is called directional, and one is called disruptive. Now, stabilizing selection is when there's variation in the in the animal trait, say weight of birth of a baby, of the young, um, but <laughs> it's very dangerous for the young to be born too small, and it's very dangerous for both the young and the mother if it's born too large. So the weight range of human babies is less than a lot of other animal species because um, the human body isn't able to give uh, large babies, the pubic area isn't wide enough for large babies often to come out, nor do very small babies have the ability to survive uh, very cold. I mean, everything's different now because we have so much technology. But look at our history. Um, 500 years ago, when we were still living in caves or teepees, the larger the baby that, that didn't hurt the mom would have the higher survival because it was able to handle cold weather, depending on when it was born. It was able to uh, uh, move around better. Um, but it can't be too big because everything that's advantageous can also be negative if it goes too far. Here's a, the giraffe is the greatest example of direction, uh, directional selection. Whereas the, and, and the giraffe is an amazing animal, really amazing animal. It's really, really hard to have an extremely long neck and get blood there. I mean, it, Gravity is constantly working against those poor animals to try and get that blood up to the brain, which needs the more oxygen of any organ in the body. So giraffes have tremendous number of adaptations that help them push blood up to the brain. And it takes an amazing number of adaptations. Therefore, that's why there's only one species in the world that has that long neck. Every other species that takes advantage of all that food, all those plants way up in the sky, climb trees. Giraffes are the only four-legged animal that stays on the ground that can get that, but it's a tremendous advantage. I think if you think about it, there's all those groceries up there that no one else can get to but you. I mean, why hasn't that evolved several times? Because several different adaptations are needed. Just to give you an example, their blood pressure is about six times what ours is, just to get that blood up to the head, heart, the head. And they, there's huge arguments on the dinosaurs, whether they actually were able to keep their head up that high for long periods of time. Um, we won't get into that. But anyway, directional selection, the longer the neck, the more food it could get, the more offspring it has, therefore it becomes more prevalent in the species. But when the head gets too high, and it's too hard to get blood to it, and then that, the, the animals that have really long necks don't ever make it to adulthood. It's just too hard to survive. It's too hard physiologically for that animal. Disruptive selection or destabilizing selection is when you have a morph that all of a sudden the two extremes from that morph, say long beaks and short beaks, or red and yellow from brown uh, butterflies are the only ones that survive. And this, this usually happens very fast and it, it, it's, it's pretty rare. In general, uh, at least Darwin's um, gradualism, long, small changes over extremely long periods of time. And, and certainly most marine or ocean fossils would seem to indicate this. Um, but more recently, there has been a, quite a bit of evidence in the fossil record that shows, wait a minute, some of these species are changing real rapidly, like hundreds of thousand years, not millions of years. So that was called, they called this punctuated equilibrium. Some people call it macroevolution. Now I took a class in graduate school where this was the first of this data was starting to come out and it was really highly debated. 
as I told you earlier in a lecture, scientists argue constantly. We fight with each other. And this class was almost ridiculous. I mean, people were screaming at each other whether or not this existed. Now, to me, I, why can't both happen? But, I mean, some of these people were so entranced into this is how it happened, they wouldn't accept new data. And you're going to do an activity on this that deals specifically with evolution. We need to be able to accept new data and change theories. Um, so, you know, good scientists will. Um, this is an interesting fact. This, these are marsupials in the bottom row. And then the top are the uh, placental mammals like you and I are. There's a wolf, there was a Tasmanian wolf, there's an ocelot, there's an, a marsupial cat, a mouse, a fat tailed mouse. These animals are not closely related. They're mammals, but they're way geographically separated and they're not that closely related. But yet, within certain environments, certain forms, long nose, long tongue for ant ears, sticky tongue, are selected for. And these traits show up in animals that aren't that closely related. So not all animals that look alike are closely related. It could be those traits are just so good for species that in, that inhabit that niche, which we'll learn about later, um, it, it just is going to be selected for. Now, we can't have a discussion in class, and, and that's one of the bad parts of it being on, online, but I left this slide in here, and I, I just, give me a minute here to make a point. Is the cockroach better adapted than the wolf? Certainly today you would say yes. There's a lot more cockroaches. They're doing very well and they love human beings. If we went back to this continent 700 years ago, is the cockroach better adapted or the wolf? The wolf rules the continent, except for humans. Wolves rule. So the wolf would be better adapted at that time. What has changed? What happened in the future that changed things? We showed up. We showed up. Humans showed up in large numbers. And, and because we have advantageous traits, we were able to kill, we were able to hunt, we were able to grow crops because we have a big brain, we can think things through, we can reason, we can develop weapons that, that can help us get our food. And we outcompeted the wolves. And because the wolves were our competitors, we killed them. So they're no longer well adapted. 700 years ago they were though. 1,000 years ago they 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, they were it. They were the cat's meow. So as time changes, don't take an animal that's extremely well adapted now and so numerous and assume that it's going to be that way forever because the environment's going to change. And if those animals have the traits to adapt to that change, great. If they don't, they're no longer here. The average life of a species is a million years mammals anyway. Okay, I want to define a species for you that, that we recognize as biologists. There are animals with similar characteristics, and this is key, they have to be able to successfully produce fertile offspring. You have donkey is a separate species from a horse. You can breed a male donkey to a mare, horse, get what's called a mule they're infertile. Mules don't breed with each other. I used to breed mules. I had two great big draft horses that I would have uh, a, a big, what they call mammoth jack, a big donkey stud breed, uh, and I would take, take the babies and train them uh, and use them in my work and or sell them. Uh, but they're, they're infertile. They're not a species. Oh, let's see. When is speciation most likely to occur? Two times, when they're geographically isolated, number one, and number two, once they get to this new area, there's a lot of exploitable zones. So when animals become separated, um, new traits are selected for, like different size bills and shapes, uh, and it, it occurs especially when 
animals are in new environments um, and they can change fairly rapidly that punctuated equilibrium again. Generalist are, is a term we use in biology that means they eat almost anything. Uh, they can get water from all different kinds of sources. They hide or they have such great protection they don't really need hide in all different kinds of places. Whereas a specialist, um, this animal this with the prober bill needs flowers. That's for nectar eating. If there's no flowers, that species is gone. Whereas a gen this is a horseshoe crab. The fossil record shows they haven't changed for over 300 million years. 300. That's well adapted. That's really well adapted. Uh, but there are generalists, and generalists do fairly well. When species evolve quickly, like I was talking about earlier, um, it's called adaptive radiation. And that's a term I'd like you to be familiar with. And, for example, when the mockingbirds showed up, or the finches showed up on the Galapagos, you have 13 different species develop, show up, evolve in 100,000 years. That's very, very fast. Um, it's not what you would expect based on Charles Darwin's first book. Um, punctuated or, or quick change does occur um, through natural selection and evolution. Last slide. Okay. Um, bad genes like cancer should be selected out of the population. I mean, why is cancer still here? Because cancer occurs after we breathe. So in humans, you don't know if you're going to get cancer. I'm 63, I haven't had cancer. Not everybody's going to have cancer. But the, I had a brother-in-law that I loved dearly, just like a brother, who died because of bone cancer at 46. Well, he'd already had four kids. That gene is in those children. These are my nieces and nephews. It worries me. Um, and that's how bad gene, a perfect example, it's, it's going to be hard to, I was worried about throwing this one in, um, is sickle cell anemia. Why is sickle cell anemia? It's a horrible disease. Um, it forms red blood cells um, that are in the shape of like a U, and they get caught up in the capillaries, and they just cut off circulation to parts of the body and the joints, which is an extreme, these people are in extreme pain uh, and often causes death, or early death, uh, sometimes even before they're able to reproduce. So why is that gene still in the population? Well, the number one killer of people in Africa is malaria, mosquitoes. They kill a million people a year, uh, and that's down quite a bit. Um, if you are, and the gene for sickle cell anemia is recessive. And if you remember back to high school biology, there's dominant genes and recessive genes. To have a recessive trait show up, you have to have two alleles, one from mom, one from dad, and that trait will show up. And it's rare. However, in sickle cell anemia, you have it show up more often than you expect based on what natural selection should be doing because those, that gene should be removed from the population. The reason why is with malaria, if someone is a heterozygote, meaning one sickle cell gene and allele and one dominant normal blood gene, they are much more resistant to malaria in people with two normal blood genes. Therefore, those people who are heterozygotes tend to have more offspring and are able to breed and survive longer than people who are, don't carry the gene at all. And that's why this gene is still so prevalent in the, in the population and causing so much pain to so many people. It's, it's really, really sad. Um, but that's a, 
a faster yet long introduction to evolution. Um, you have a review to fill out after watching this PowerPoint. Uh, you should be able to answer every one of those questions. Um, and if you have any other questions or I didn't make sense on something, please feel free to email me. Um, and I'll talk to you guys later.